All right, so this morning, again, we're into part two of the GOAT, the greatest of all times. And of course, uh, as we said as a way of introducing this on last week, you know, that's a phrase that our culture has uh, adopted, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And, and we already know who it is, right? We know it's Jesus. And of course, you know, as I said on last week, many argue about who the greatest of all times is in this sport and that sport or in entertainment, politics, government, and so forth. But no individual, when you really stop and think about it, has life has had greater consequence, greater weight, and greater meaning than the life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Am I right, somebody? There's no life that has had greater meaning, greater weight, and greater importance than the life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And that's why he is the undisputed greatest of all time. But you know, we as followers of Jesus, as I've observed, I, I have learned that we as Christians, followers of Jesus, the body of Christ, don't appreciate enough why he is the greatest of all times. And I believe we need to know a little bit more about the one who we call Lord. Amen? And know about him and why he's so great. In fact, one of his disciples, Peter, wrote a letter later in his life. And he said this. He says, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within you. In other words, we, we ought to be uh, people who are always ready to be able to share why it is we are a follower of Jesus Christ, why we believe he is the greatest of all time. And that's what we're doing a little bit as we get into this. And there's no better way to prepare for Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday than to study the life of Jesus. Well, today, as I introduce this, we need to appreciate this, that becoming the greatest of all time, what Jesus did, was not something that was automatic. Well, it wasn't automatic just because of who he was. He had to go through a process. He was definitely God, was, and is always eternally God, the Son of God, the Word made flesh. However, when he became flesh, he became a man. And he laid aside his deity, as it were, in the sense that he did not act in the earth as deity. He acted as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. He certainly was deity, but he did what he did in the earth as a man so that he could die on behalf of mankind. We know the story that Adam messed things up. But Jesus came to make things right. In fact, Jesus is actually in the scripture called the last Adam. Why would he be called the last Adam and not the second Adam? Because if it's a second Adam, it might be a third Adam, and it might be a fourth Adam, and it might be a fifth and a sixteenth and a 728th Adam. But he's called the last Adam. Why? Because Adam, the first man, of, of the first man made in God's image and likeness, was not just a person, a man unto himself. He was a representative of all mankind. He was a figurehead for all mankind. That's why when he sinned, all of humanity fell into sin. And so it took a man who would also be a figurehead for all of humanity. And that person was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God. And when he died and lived a perfect life, and gave his blood and was raised from the dead, we were raised with him and received his righteousness. And he became the figurehead for all of humanity and all who believe him in him and embrace him and accept and receive what he has accomplished and call him Lord, we become saved and redeemed and born again. But that didn't happen automatically. He had to go through a process. He had to be uh, he had to go through the same things that all great champions have to go through in order to become the greatest of all time. He had to go through a process. And so in the realm of athletic competition, Jesus did the same similar things. And regardless of what their area of excellence is, all great men and women have one thing in common. They have heart. They have heart. They've got courage. They've got strength. And today, that's what we're talking about, the heart of the champion. Jesus had the heart of a champion in his earthly walk. And we want to look at four qualities of the heart of a champion. And I know we'll learn some things about how we can be champions in our walk with God as we listen to these things. What does the heart of a champion have? 
How did, how did he go through the process and become the greatest of all times? I, I believe, if again, if we were looking at the realm of competitive athletics, we would see these qualities. Maybe we could talk about 20 of them, but we're boiling them down to just a few today. The heart of a champion. Jesus had the heart of a champion. And number one, all champions have this in common. Jesus was a man of preparation. He, he was a man of preparation. He didn't just expect just because of who he was, everything was going to fall into place. He was prepared for his process, for his life, for his journey, or for his assignment. He was a man of preparation. And by the way, the notes, of course, media team is making them available there and you can go on you version and find them as well all right jesus was a man of what preparation what is preparation here's a simple definition preparation is the action or process of making something ready for use or service now think about that in the life of jesus preparation is the action or process of making something ready for use or service Jesus was a prepared man. We know, as we'll see without getting ahead of myself, we know that as a very, very, very young man, he actually knew who he was. And by knew who he was, what I mean by that is he knew he was the son of God. And we know he knows that at least at 12 years old, may have known it sooner, but the scripture reveals that he knows it at 12 years old. And as we're going to see, he was preparing for his assignment. He didn't just say, I'm the son of God. Therefore, everything that is ought to fall into place. No, he had to prepare. And let's look at what he did. This is what made him the greatest. In Luke chapter 2, we're reading down from verses 45 through 49, and we're looking at the New Living Translation. It says, when they could not find him. Now, what, what's happening here? They went up to Jerusalem. They went from Galilee, traveled south to Jerusalem and uh, for one of the great feasts. They had a time of the a great feast, one of the uh, Jewish uh, Hebrew festivals and, and uh, observances. And then they were on their way back up to Galilee with a bunch of family and friends. After a few days, they realized, wait a minute, has anybody seen Jesus? No, I thought so-and-so had him. Have you seen Jesus? No, I thought he had him. Well, have you seen Jesus? No, I thought you had him. Oh, my goodness, Jesus is not with us. How do you lose the Son of God? That's pretty bad when you lose the Son of God. So they, they lost Jesus, turned around. Well, the only thing we can do is go back. So they go back, and uh, sure enough, he's in Jerusalem, all right. And he's actually in the temple in Jerusalem at the Temple Mount, and here's where we find him. Verse 45, they couldn't find him. They went back to Jerusalem and searched for him there. Three days later, can you imagine the emotion of parents missing their child for three days? Okay, that is just, that is beyond the, the worst psychologically. But three days later, they finally discovered him in the temple sitting among the religious teachers. Now watch what he's doing. What is he doing? Come on, read the rest of that verse with me. He's doing what? He's listening to them and asking them questions. Oh, man, I say it all the time. But, you know, it's my son. I, get the, I got the mic today, so I'll say it again. We read the Bible too quickly. Sometimes we read just a little too quickly. He's sitting among the religious teachers. What's the first thing he's doing? Listening to them and asking them questions. Okay, let's rewind a few minutes. He's the son of God. Uh, hello, that means he's God. And he's listening. Now he's man, and so as man, he must learn. Now he knows he's the son of God, yet as the son of man, he is so humble that the one who created all things is listening to the teachers of the law. So this reveals something. You see, the truly great in any area of life have a deep humility if you really want to be great. In fact, the higher you want to go, the more humble you have to be. Praise God. It's nine amens. Let's see if we can get a little bit more on the next one. The higher you want to go, 
the, the more humble we have to be. Amen. Absolutely. The Son of God was sitting and he was listening and then asking questions of the religious leaders or the teachers or the doctors of the Word of God at that time. And here's what happened. All who heard him, which meant he was listening, he was asking questions, and then he was talking. And when they heard him, they were amazed at his answers and his understanding. So he had advanced understanding and he had advanced answers. Why were they amazed? Because of his age. Well, why did he have answers? Because he had been studying. He had been preparing. He'd been preparing to be our Savior. He didn't take it for granted. You see, all the greats are histories of the game. They're historians of the game. You go to any sport. I pick sports because it's, it's, it's such, it applies so easily to our culture and our mindset. But you ask any of the greats in any sport, whether today or yesterday, whether it's a LeBron James or Michael Jordan or in golf or Tiger Woods or, you know, or, or Phil Mickelson or any sport, boxing, golf, tennis, you know, it doesn't matter. They will always be able to give you a history of the game because you know what they've done? They studied the greats because in order to be great, you have to study the great. In order to be, uh, be significant, you have to study significance. And of course, Jesus knew his history. He, he was a historian of who he was and the Father's plan and the kingdom of God. He knew his stuff. He was a student of the scripture. Now his parents in verse 48, they didn't know what to think. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this? Your father and I have been frantic. We've been searching all over for you. You didn't call us. You didn't text or anything. Well, he couldn't do that. I'm sorry. But, but, but why? Why did you need to search, Jesus said? Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? We looked into that a few weeks ago. Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? He was a student. He was preparing for his assignment. He did not take it for granted. Psalm number 40 in verse number 6. Psalm number 40 in verse 6. Now, we're going to read two scriptures back to back. We're going to read Psalm 40, and then in a moment, we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 5. Now, let me set up Psalm number 40. Psalm number 40 is a, is a psalm written by David, and uh, uh, Bible scholars have, we have noticed over the years that some of the psalms fall into certain categories. <clears throat> They can be categorized by uh, what they say, the content, the language. And one of the, one of the categories of the Psalms is a group of Psalms called Messianic Psalms. Messianic Psalms. They are Psalms in which the Holy Spirit inspired the writer. Many of the Psalms are written by David, but there are actually other writers and songwriters in the Psalms. But many of them are written by David where the Holy Spirit would inspire the writer that when they wrote the song or the psalm or the poem, they would be speaking about things that were relevant to their day and to their time, but at the same time, I'm almost certain unbeknownst to them, they were also writing prophetically about the Messiah, the life he would live, the role he would play, and even in some cases how he would die and parts of his life. You see this throughout some of the Psalms. They are called Messianic Psalms. One of them, for example, you go back and look at it later, is Psalm number 2. Psalm number 2 is a Messianic Psalm. And uh, I don't have it in my notes, but let's just turn there real quick just to look at that. Take a little side journey because this will help us appreciate when we go back to Psalm number 40 about Jesus being prepared. Psalm number 2. It's a short psalm, but it's a messianic psalm. And I'm going to pick up reading at verse number 1. Again, this is the New Living Translation. Listen to this. It says, why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Who's his anointed one? Jesus. That's right. Jesus is anointed one. They say, let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. But the one who rules in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then in anger, he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. 
For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen. Who's his chosen? Jesus. I've placed my chosen king on the throne. Where? In Jerusalem on my holy mountain. The Lord, the king proclaims the Lord's decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Uh, I, be, I become your father. Only ask and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the whole earth for your possessions. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will smash them like clay pots. Now then you kings, kings of the earth, act wisely. In other words, temporal leaders, political leaders, premiers, dictators, and prime ministers, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's royal son. Who's his son? Or he will become angry and you will be destroyed in the midst of all your activities for his fierce or his anger flares up in an instant. But what joy for all those who take refuge in him. You say, whoa, wait a minute. What's all this anger and fierce and rod of iron? What's that? I thought Jesus was the prince of peace and come on, forgive, go and sin no more. What is he talking about? This is a messianic psalm describing the return of the Lord Jesus. And it is a description of what happened. This isn't the teaching today, but in the book of Revelation at the end of this particular age, when Jesus comes back to the earth to rule and reign for 1,000 years, at, the, at that moment, there will be a great battle called the Battle of Armageddon, in which time preceding that have been a number of years. All Bible, most Bible scholars believe that seven years in which the Antichrist will attempt to rule the whole world and have influence. Eventually, he will stir up all of the nations and they will literally try to war against the Lord Jesus Christ. They will be that foolish to actually battle against God. But remember, this is the same Satan who tricked a third of the angels out of heaven to roll with him. So apparently he has pretty uh, uh, persuasive uh, deceptive powers in order to seduce people to follow him. Well, this will happen. And this psalm is describing. And he's saying, no, I will set my king upon the mountain in Jerusalem and he will rule. And then he says, he says he will rule with a rod of iron. Now, what is that? What is that phrase about rule with a rod of iron? That is a picture of stern leadership. What I see, the Prince of Peace, isn't he love? Yes, but remember at that time, these are nations who have rejected him and kings who think like Pharaoh that they're God and he's not. So if you will be hard set against him, to you he will rule with the rod of iron. In other words, you will see another side of him. You won't be sweet little lamb Jesus, meek and mild. He will be the lion of the tribe of Judah. And if you're on the wrong side of him, you will see he will rule with a rod of iron. He will regulate. And there will be no question about who is Lord, who is God, who is king, who is running things. There will be no question about it. And even now in this time, you see, it's easy to not think that'll be the case. Because he isn't physically here regulating with that level of authority. But he is at still that person. And the wise men and women will get on the right side of him right now so that we can rule and reign with him. But there will always be people as long as there is fallen nature who will, watch this, not have to, but choose to reject him or choose to not yield to him. It is a choice. They don't, God doesn't make anybody not choose him. People make that choice for themselves. And when they make that choice, then they will run into the rod of iron, particularly at that time. Right now, thank God for his mercy. His mercies are new every morning. And the Bible says, now listen, you're always talking about, Peter said this, generations are always talking about the Lord is coming, oh, the Lord is coming, oh, the Lord is coming. We've been hearing that for years. Peter said, hold on, guys, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise to return. He will return. But right now, I'm paraphrasing big time. He says he's waiting. He's waiting. So why? Because he wants to have mercy, not willing that any should perish. Because once again, if he pulls the plug and comes right now, there's a whole lot that would perish. But because of his mercy, he's waiting. But don't mistake his waiting for softness. Amen.
But that's a messianic psalm because it's really about the future prophetic scripture, prophetic psalm about the Messiah. Now, Psalm number 40, verses 6 through 8. Here is another messianic psalm in which David is writing about something relative to his life, but without knowing it by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's actually speaking about something directly related to the Lord Jesus. And the reason we know it, because the scriptures will tell us in the New Testament that Jesus took David's very own words and applied them to himself. Now watch this. This is all about being what? Jesus was a man who was what? Prepared. He was prepared because he read the word. Come on, if we're going to be prepared, we need to read the word too. For our journey, Psalm number 40, 6 through 8. He says, you take no delight in sacrifices, David said, or offerings. He says, that's not the thing you're really into. Now that you, now that you have made me listen, I finally understand. You don't require burnt offerings or sin offerings. Then I said, look, I have come as is written about me in the scriptures. Say that with me. As is written about me in the scriptures. I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. So now David is writing in his own journey, in his own flow with the Lord. And of course, David did live in the Old Testament. How many of you know that? I mean, oh, there was sacrifices required and so forth. But David was so close to God. See, when he was so close to God that he, he, he got beyond the surface. People knew the laws and the regulations, but David knew his heart. And he said, yeah, I know the sacrifice. I know we're supposed to do that, and that's on the book. And next week is so-and-so's turn to light the incense. And I get all that. But actually, God, I just got close enough to you, and my ears are open enough to now know what's really going on. That's not really what you went to. That, that's, that's, a, that's a formality that gives us a way that we can engage you who is so above our level of thinking and you have, you have made it available so we on our level can engage with you in some way. But that's not really what you're into. And you will see here and in other Psalms, David said, what you really want is a contrite heart and a broken spirit. What you really want is someone who is broken and yielded before you. Because if all the sacrifices and the outward actions are doing all of that and their heart isn't in it, if it's just function, if it's just form, and we need to know that today, if it's just serving, if it's just form, if it's just showing up, but our hearts aren't really into it then we aren't going anywhere in God. And like the, 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 probably the worst thing about it is we can be deceiving ourselves and thinking we're good and everything is okay the way it ought to be because we're physically here or we're doing the thing or, uh, or I'm preaching the word or ushering or singing or parking the car. All of that is good, but our heart must be in it. Because the thing he really wants is a heart. And David knew that. But he was also speaking about the Lord. How do we know? Well, let's go over to Hebrews chapter 10, picking up at verse number 5. So, the writer of Hebrews, a whole lot of people believe it's Paul for many reasons. This is one epistle where the author doesn't name himself. So we don't know for sure, but, you know, most believe it's Paul. That's fine. I'll go with that. All right. Verse 5 says this. That is why when Christ came into the world. Who came into the world? When Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings. Wait a minute. Didn't we just hear that recently? Where did we hear that? Psalm 40. And you know where he's picking that up from? Right from the scripture. Um, he said, you didn't want animal sacrifice or sin offerings. Now he added another insight. Come on, what does the next sentence say? But you have given me a body to offer. I'm the sacrifice. See, then it was lambs and goats and bullocks, but, they, but, but Jesus had another revelation. He picked up on David's revelation, and then he realized, actually, this is written about me. David couldn't go this far because David wasn't the sacrifice, but I'm the sacrifice. 
So you, you have prepared, you have given a body to offer. And of course, that body came when Mary received the word and became flesh. She conceived supernaturally, and that's where his body came from. The word produced his body. When Gabriel said, Mary, you will have a son. He'll be the son of the highest. Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And if you receive this, you know, he said, therefore that thing which shall be born of you shall be holy and shall be called the son of God. Well, when she said, ah, that doesn't make sense to me. I've never been with the man. I don't know how, but okay. All right, Gabriel, be it unto me according to your word. Boom, there it is. She received it. Supernatural conception. That's where the body was prepared. Now the Son of God can supernaturally be on our calculus and way beyond the pay grade of any of our intellect put together. He comes inside of the womb of a woman. And in the Word of God becomes flesh. So, you've given me a body. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings of foresaid. In other words, that really wasn't your highest in this. It just held mankind over for a while. But that's not what you were really pleased with. Then I said, come on, read verse 7 with me. Then I said, Lord, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written about me in the scriptures. So if it says when Christ came into the world, he said this. This means that the whole, we only know this by the Holy Spirit. And the writer of this could not know because he wasn't sitting in Jesus' study or his closet and heard Jesus say, mm, as it is written of me, Lord, you don't want animals. No man heard Jesus say that. But the Holy Spirit knew it. And the Holy Spirit is revealing to us that Jesus said this. Well, where did Jesus say it? He said it when he read the 40th Psalm. So what does that mean he was doing? He was preparing. He was seeing himself in the Word. And that's how he was prepared. That's why he was able to do what he did because he already saw himself in the Word. He knew it was God's plan. He knew God's plan for him. And that's why he could stay consistent. Because he knew it. He knew, he knew this was his purpose. That's why you would always hear Jesus say things like this. For this purpose, the Son of Man is coming to the earth. For this purpose came I into the world. For the Son of Man came not to serve himself or to be served, but to serve others and to give him a a ransom for many. Why does he keep saying that? Because he knows his purpose. He knows he's to lay his life down. Why? Because he read about himself in the book. He was prepared. Number two, Jesus was a man of self-discipline. Jesus was a man of self-discipline. And I know that word makes us shout, scream, and I, I just know you're shouting on the inside, praise God, because you don't want to overwhelm the, the amplifying system and all that kind of stuff. But that's fine. That's fine. I hear you shouting. But here's the thing. Self-discipline. What is it? Self-discipline, it's, it's two parts the way I've defined it here. And this is just how it came to my heart. I know you can look up a dictionary and see it, but this is how it came to me for the application of this study today. Self-discipline, A, the ability to make yourself do the things that will produce the greatest results in your life. Self-discipline is the ability to do, to make yourself. Somebody say, make myself. make myself. It's the ability to make myself do the things that will produce the greatest results in our lives. That's a simple definition of, of self-discipline because that can apply to any area. But it's the ability to make ourselves do the things that will result in the greatest or will produce the greatest results in our lives. And then, uh, then a companion to that, or maybe side B, or the other side of the coin of self-discipline is this. It is the ability to tell yourself no to the things that would prevent you from having the greatest results in your life. So it is the ability to make myself do the things that will produce the greatest results spiritually, financially, marriage, parentally, vocationally, every area. Physically, all these things, mentally, intellectually, academically, it's making myself do the things that will produce the greatest results. That's discipline in a simple definition. 
And then it's making, it's the ability, the ability. Say the ability. ability. Say, I have, I have the, ability the ability by the power of self-discipline with the help of Holy Spirit to tell myself no to things that would prevent me from having the greatest results in my life. Amen. So then self-discipline is a cool thing, isn't it? Mm. All right. So what I was saying was, so self-discipline is a cool thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I remember a book, I've I, I read this, was called In Celebration of Discipline. It's a word, come on, if we just honest, we don't like, we don't like the word discipline. I, I, I don't like the word, but you know what? I know it's good for me. I know it's good for us. We don't like it because it's hard on our flesh sometimes. Because our flesh likes ease. Come on, preaching really good right along in here. Our flesh likes ease. Our flesh likes comfort. Our flesh loves sleep. Come on, our flesh loves to sleep as long as it wants, to eat as much as it wants. In other words, if we just let it, our flesh would let us have us do anything and everything as long as it's happy and satisfied. But the problem is it will not produce the greatest results in our lives. And I'm not talking flesh. I'm not always just talking about physical body, physical functions. I'm talking about even our mind and our thinking. We have to become, uh, we have to develop in discipline. And thank God we can grow in it. Thank God wherever we are, we can grow in discipline. We can get a little bit better every time. Amen? All the time. Praise God. All right? So watch this. Jesus is disciplined. And this is what made him one of the, the not one of, excuse me, the greatest of all time. This is what makes the greats in areas of competitive athletics the greatest. I, I talk to any man or woman here, and if we got to talking about sports, and you, you list the great ones, we'll all talk about their discipline. We'll all talk about Walter Payton in the offseason. Come on, running uphill in the off-season. You know, off-season when you can relax, but not the greatest of all time. They don't relax. They relax, but they're still disciplined. The great ones are, Tiger Woods, has said, this is, I've, I've read about this and I've seen interviews about it. I don't know if he's still doing it today, but I know at the peak of his game, just picking him because we, you know, it's a name we all household name. But we know the greatness he has had in the realm of golf. But after, after a round, he would go and, go and hit at least 500 balls after 18 holes. Now, everybody else going to the clubhouse, going to sleep, they're going to have a few drinks, going to do whatever. What's he doing? Why? Because in his mind, he believed he was supposed to be the greatest of all time. You can, do, you can go in any area. You can talk about Larry Bird before the game, two hours before the game. All the greats. All the greats. They, uh, they're disciplined. They make themselves do what will produce the greatest results. Now, Jesus did this too. He had the ability to make himself do what will produce the greatest results. And one of the times we'll look into his life is during his 40 days in the wilderness. We know he fasted 40 days. We know the discipline that it took, come on, to make yourself not eat. Come on, if you've ever done any kind of fast, it's, how, many, how many have said you're going to do a three-day fast before, and on day one, about six hours in, you thought you was going to die? I mean die, dead. You didn't even, you hadn't eaten a Big Mac in six months. But the moment you told your body you were going to fast, you just saw Big Macs. You just saw billboards about Big Macs. You, your mind start tasting Big Macs. You, and, or before that, your body said, well, you might as well go on and pig out right now since you're going to be fasting for three days. You might as well go on and get this and that and get that dessert and get that other pound cake too. Just eat the whole thing. Just go and eat the whole thing. You're going on a fast. Come on, you know I'm telling the truth. So all, all I'm saying is that's a discipline, 
right? Now, we know fasting is a spiritual exchange, right? Because we have no record of the Holy Spirit demanding him to fast. We have no record of the Father making him do it. And he sure wasn't doing it to be in right relationship with God and to get close to God because the man just spoke out of heaven and said, here's my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. If God, when God announces publicly that he well pleased with you, you tight. You, you tight. You tight with God. So he's not fasting. Watch this. To get tight with God. Wow. What insight does Jesus have then that maybe we should look into since he's tight with God and all his needs are met? Huh. Well, let's just say for sake of time, when he came out, the Bible says he went in under the power, submitted to the power of the Holy Spirit. And when he came out, he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. He came yielded to the Holy Spirit. He obeyed the Holy Spirit in the wilderness and he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, fasting is a spiritual exchange that produces power. When we go in with the right attitudes and so forth. And listen, if you're on a fast now, you've been in a fast, and you missed it, listen, don't get into condemnation. Okay? Throw the Big Mac container away, and then get up and say, Father, I thank you just for helping me. Thank you for helping me in the name of Jesus. Because listen, especially if God didn't command you to do it, they celebrate every step of progress you make. Hey, praise God, daughter. Hey, you did six hours, you did a day, praise God. I know you said three days, but I'm not mad at you, I'm not, I'm not condemning you. You win a day, I didn't command you to do it. You're stepping out and trying to engage me at another level. We're celebrating that, way to go. Way to go, son, that's it, that's my boy. All right, let's get back at it, right? See, this is different from God's command. This is not under law. And even when we do that as a church, it's not under law. It's the opportunity to engage God at another level. And as you walk close enough with God, and you have to walk close enough with him to be intimately hearing his voice, you'll know when he actually commanded you to. And when you walk in that close, there's already levels of discipline in you anyway to know that closely that he actually commanded it to you to do it. And then the discipline tends to come along with that because you have to have a certain discipline to hear his voice that way. So if you ain't rolling like that and, it's a, and you're fasting, you fall, listen, pick yourself up and keep on going. Understand you're growing in some stuff. Amen. Does that help anybody? All right, so now watch this. Jesus then was what? Full of who? Holy Spirit. He was half full, full of him. He was full of Holy Spirit. Returned from the Jordan River. That's where he just got baptized. And then was led by the Spirit. So he's full of the Spirit. Now he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Okay? Talking about discipline. So where in the wilderness during the time he was tempted by the devil how many days? Okay, Jesus ate nada, nothing, zero, my hero. All the time, and he became what? Was he hungry or very hungry? Very hungry. Why was he hungry? Because he's a man. God can't get hungry. As we read during the offering last week, we said the offering isn't for his sake, it's for our sake. Because in the 50th Psalm, he says, if I were hungry, now, he's condescending to our level because he can't relate to hunger. But he's saying, I know you guys can relate to hunger, so let me say it this way. If I was hungry, he said, I wouldn't ask you. For, could you get me something to eat? He said, I wouldn't ask you for something to eat. Why not, God? Because the earth is mine in the fullness thereof. I go eat whatever I want to if I was hungry. So then why are we engaging God in our finances? For, our, for our, his sake? Uh, for our sake and our covenant with him. All right. All right. So watch this. The devil, the devil came to him right after he, we knew he was really hungry and said, uh, if you're the son of God, tell the stone to become a loaf of bread with some hot butter and, and some, some honey and whatever else. He said, can't you just see it, Jesus? Come on, you're the son of God. I know you can do it. You know you can do it. 
Man, you turn water into wine. Easily you can turn these stones into bread. Come on now. You know you can do this. You know you can do this. Jesus said, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. All I'm saying is he had the ability to make, to tell, in this case, himself no to what would not produce the greatest results. For him to use his power in this way would have been sin because it would have been taking his authority and his life into his own hands. And for his level of intimacy with God, that's known sin. It's sin when we do it too. It's just that he was so aware of it that they're showing you that even is something as simple as that that he had the power to do would have been sin. Ooh, there's a lot of insight in it. Because that means there are a lot of things we have the power to do to take into our own hand and we just stepped out of the will of God. One of the most profound passages of scripture to me is it, I think it's either, I think it's First Chronicles 21 or First Kings. They're kind of companion stories if you've read through the Old Testament. I think it's First Chronicles 21, First Kings 21. Somewhere in that neighborhood, don't, don't, don't hold me to that, but here's the story. It says that one day Satan came, Satan came and tempted and caused David to sin. How? By counting the armies of Israel. That's suck. Because David, last I checked at this time, is the head of state. You know, he is the president and king of the nation. Shouldn't the king, shouldn't the president, shouldn't the prime minister know where his standing army is? Stats, who's who, you know, how many regiments we have, what's our position over here, what's our position there, how many ships we got, and you know, so forth. Talk with his joint chiefs and so forth. It says, Satan caused David to sin by counting the people of Israel. You said, what's wrong with that? What was wrong with it is because by counting them, what he was tempting him to do is put your trust in your arm. Put your trust in your numbers. Put your trust in the people. Put your trust in the arm of your flesh and what you can make happen. Now, see, that doesn't seem like a big deal to count. I mean, hey, I need to know what we got. But see, God looks at the heart, and he's always monitoring our hearts. And that simple act of counting that we would just say, well, the man does need to know. No, God sees through all that smoke and mirrors, and he says, no, what that is is you seeing how secure you are based on how many numbers you got. Oh, I'm preaching, preaching really good right there how secure you are based on how many numbers you have. Mm -hmm. And to a man that close with God, a man whose God's son would be called forever the son of David, David can't get away with that. See, now he can't get away with that. And it messed him up, caused a lot of death too. Oh, in other words, it opened it up for the enemy to come in. Watch this, just a subtle thing in the heart. Oh, he wasn't sleeping with nobody. Not on this one, we know he messed up in the past. I mean, you know, not, not this time. No, come on, not this time. Come on, he wasn't in the bed with nobody, he shouldn't have been. Come on, he did this doing good here. Come on, wasn't looking at nothing he shouldn't have been looking at. Come on, somebody. All he was doing was counting. And it brought more death than when he was in the bed with somebody he shouldn't have been. Isn't that something? Now, both of them are wrong. Come on, talk to me, somebody. But what I'm trying to show you is the point that's being brought out in that situation of how, how we can jump off into some wrong positions with a little adjustment, wrong position in our heart. Come on, look at somebody. and Don't answer, but just look thoughtfully and say, where's your trust? Hmm. Come on, now we're saying Jesus was a man of what? Self-discipline. Okay, watch this, Luke 5. Let's move, we got to move. Luke 5, Luke 5. Luke 5, 15 and 16. But despite Jesus' instructions, okay, what happened? Well, Jesus went about healing, preaching, teaching, setting people free. And uh, he said, listen, listen, when, when I 
when you're set free, listen, I need you to not tell anybody. Now, to me, that, that's humorous. Are you kidding? I've been in this condition all this long, and you telling me not to tell somebody? Yeah, I need you to not say something. You ever wonder why Jesus would heal them, this great miraculous miracle, and say, hey, man, I need you to keep that, keep that law. Don't say it. What? Don't say nothing. Because, see, what would happen is he would be trying to go into certain towns. And he would be on his way there. And if they told everybody, and you can actually read this, you read through the Gospels, the crowd got so big and it was such a ruckus that he couldn't even get into the town that the Lord told him to go to and had to go through a lot of drama because all the news had spread. So this is what we're reading about one of those instances. Jesus, despite Jesus' instructions, they're like, Jesus, man, I love you, I respect you, but I don't care what you say, I'm telling everybody about this. It said the report of his power spread even faster and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But what did Jesus do? He often, what did he do? Often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Now, what does often mean? A lot. So what was happening a lot? A lot of times, large crowds were drawing and demanding of him. And a lot of times, what would he do? Go move the crowd, go work the crowd, go say, hey, come on, let's do it. Come on, who next, who next? You know what he would do? i see y'all later, I'm going to pray. Isn't that interesting? That's self-discipline. Because how I many know when things are cooking and things are good and popularity is high? Come on, the easiest thing in the world is just, just, just roll with this. Come on, let's ride this way, baby. Come on, the people are coming. Let's ride this puppy. Jesus was like, no. Why? Because self-discipline is the ability to make yourself do what will produce the greatest results. What will produce the greatest results is his time with God. It's time in the secret place. His time before God. See, all the crowds, that ain't, all that is is the product of his pride. It's his time with God that produced that. So he has enough discipline to know that I can't just ride on this. Because this is just for a moment. And he knows, man, they'll turn their back on you in a minute. Because he's also read Exodus. Numbers in Deuteronomy. So he knows I got to be before God because that's where my strength is. So he would often leave the crowd and see that's unnatural. Because how I many know if we're not careful, our natural flesh, intellect, and emotions can like that and think that that's where it's at. That's not where it's at. That's only the prudence. That's the fruit on the limbs. The real life is before God. Man, my time is running, but let me tell you some stories. This is good stuff here. I was reading about uh, uh, many, God has raised up over the years, many men and women who've been used mightily, and part of their role is to help not just be people of miracles, signs, and wonders, but to also, the role of these great figures that are well known is to impart into the body of Christ to multiply themselves and others so that every day person in the seats is also can walk in the same measure of what they walk for their assignment. One of those figures in church history in recent years is a man named Benny Hinn. How many have ever heard of Benny Hinn? Well, he's had a, you know, kind of a, most of known widely for healing ministry. Well, one time he was uh, sitting at lunch or dinner with some people and uh, he was, this is talking about discipline. He's sitting, it's after service, they're eating, they're fellowshipping, having a good time, and all of a sudden, Benny Hinn has the fork right up to his mouth and he stopped and looked as if he's sparing, staring in his face. And, uh, and he dropped his fork. He said, excuse me, gentlemen, I'm sorry. I have to go. The Lord is calling me to pray. Now, a little subtle thing. A little subtle thing. But here he is, doing nothing wrong, enjoying fellowship after service, but he's so disciplined in this moment that he says, you know what? I'm leaving. The Lord's calling me to go be with him. He said, what's going to happen? We don't know what's going to happen. But what happened was it was that kind of discipline that produced many of the things that we would see on television and all that. That comes out of the private place. God. Okay? 
Matthew 26, 50 through 54. Jesus said, now this is uh, near the end of his earthly ministry. They're coming to arrest him and so forth, right? So Jesus said to uh, Judas, he says, my friend, go and do what you've come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword. Who was that? Peter struck the high priest slave, slashing off his ear. Oh, my goodness. Jesus says, put away your sword, man. He says, those who use the sword will die by the sword. In other words, you don't, don't deal with this that way. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly? Watch this. Read verse 54 with me. Come on, ready? Read. But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? I'm disciplined. He didn't let the pressure of the moment make him do something that would not produce the greatest results. Because he had the ability to call. He didn't have to be arrested. He didn't have to let them do this. He stopped this show right now. We put in all this. Father, Michael, and all your boys, now. One angel in the Old Testament killed 183,000 men. One angel. He never lacked power. This was all him yielding to God's plan. So somebody with that kind of power requires a lot of discipline. See, the greater power you want to have, the more discipline you have to have. And that shows you how much discipline when you created the jokers that's trying to arrest you. And then you yield to them. And then don't call for backup to show them how powerful you are. What humility. What discipline. Right? This is why, folks, he's the greatest of all time. No other man would have been in that position and did what he did. No one else has done what they've done. No one else has created the very people that are coming to arrest and hurt and wound and kill him and stood before him and humbly restrained themselves from, take, from knocking them into 10 years from now. Only one person has done that. That's why he's the greatest of all time. And here's what's deep about it. Verse 64 of John 6, 64. Study this later. Just read, read along with me. Here's what he knew. It says, some of you do not believe. This was after his <laughs> teaching about his flesh and his blood. See, so he says, some of you don't believe. Watch this. For Jesus knew from when? When? The beginning which ones didn't believe and from when the beginning he knew exactly who would betray him from day one that's discipline because Judas wouldn't have made it the first week with all of us And then we would not have been the captain of the world's salvation. It had been you, the Father, and Holy Spirit, and all humanity in hell. That's how that would have ended up. Well, it was a great plan. We did good right up through Abraham, Isaiah. We did good right up to John. John the Baptist, he held his part, and then, well... They got mad. Oh, well, there's humanity. Mm -hmm. He knew it from the beginning. Y'all think he just found out the Holy Ghost told him when he dipped it? No, he'd been knowing that from day one. That's discipline. Because if he does that, he messes up the plan. He doesn't have his highest and best. Remember, Jesus received a name that is greater than any other name. He didn't just have it. There was other folk named Jesus, guys. Yeshua, Joshua, that's Jesus. It's just, and we just say it in an English-American way. We know it's Yeshua or Yeshua. We know that. But we just say Jesus. What well, question is, what you going to do with Yeshua? If you pronounce it right. What you going to do with him? Is he Lord? Is he running and regulating your life now that you've pronounced it right? And now that everybody's in the Bible that's black now, is he God? Is he Lord? 
Do you yield your life to him? Or is it just an ethnic thing? If we get enough revelation of who he is, it'll solve those pains. But don't let the devil pimp and mislead and manipulate hurt from history. And that's what he's done when we lack truth. He pimps our pain culturally. He'll look for this deception and division any way he can, doesn't care how it comes. All right. Number three, Jesus was a man of perseverance. Is that number three? No, number three is a man of focus, a man of focus. All right, let's go. Jesus was a man of focus. What is focus? Focus is the ability to maintain your attention on a particular goal or outcome. Matthew, Mark chapter 1, we'll read 32 to 39. I'll read quickly. That evening, that evening, sun was set. Many were sick, demon-possessed. People brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. But because the demons knew who he was, he told them to shut up, don't say anything. So he's trying to keep that low right now. But before daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to do what? There he is again. Later, Simon and the others went to find him and said, Lord, where you been? We've been looking all over for you, man. Jesus replied to them, we must go to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. This is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Here's what they were saying. Listen, we're looking all over for you, man. You saw what happened last night? The crowds are amazing. They're ready to hold a meeting. They rented the hall already. They got 800 chairs. We can get this thing already set up from 6 to 11. We got it from 6 to 11. He said, we're getting ready to leave town. What? We got the hall reserved. It's 800 people. The, the guy going to give us half off and everything because he said he appreciates you a preacher and he's going to give you a discount and everything. He said, no, we're leaving. He said, why? Why? We got it going. Let's ride this wave, baby. He said, no. God's told me to go somewhere else. He's disciplined. And in this case, we see he's focused. He has the ability to keep his attention on a particular outcome. John 6, 14 says this, when the people saw him do this, do what? Well, he fed people with two, five loaves and two fish. When they saw this sign, they said, surely, he's the prophet we've been expecting. This is him, y'all. This is him. And then what happened? Verse 15, read it with me. Come on, ready, read. When Jesus saw that they were getting ready to force this man to be king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. They were going to make him king. That's it, brother. You the Messiah. I know you don't want this, Jesus, but we get ready to make you king, man. You're going to be our king, Jesus. He's like, no, I ain't. Not right now. Oh, I'm a king. Oh, I know who I am. He wasn't lacking proper esteem of himself. This wasn't false humility. This wasn't shyness. This wasn't timidity. Oh, Jesus, Jesus just meek and humble, don't want to be king. It wasn't none of that punk stuff. He knew exactly who he was. He wasn't being timid, wasn't being some weak man, and now I don't want to take no high position. Baloney. It wasn't none of that. He knew exactly who he was. It wasn't time yet. He was so focused that he wouldn't let them, if he's got any ambition about his own thing, an ounce of it, he lets them make him king. But he's focused. See, I'm going to be focused. Last thing, last point here. Jesus was a man of what? Perseverance. He was a man of perseverance. Perseverance is the continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties or opposition. Perseverance is the continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties or opposition. When you look at the greatest of all time in any field of com competition, athletic sports, Arts and entertainment, I'm going to tell you these four things they definitely have. They have heart, and they've got the heart of a champion. And who are four qualities? Number one, they are prepared. They know their history. Number two, they are self-disciplined. Number three, they are people of focus. Okay? And then number four, they are people of perseverance. You cannot become great without perseverance. And see, we, we need to understand this. Jesus had to persevere, y'all just like we do. Because remember what we said last week, he's not a high priest that can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The reason we can relate to him and he can relate to us because he had to walk this like we do. 
But except when we realize the weight that was on him and who he was and how disciplined he was and how focused he was, he's the greatest of all time. And he's Lord and he's God. And it makes us able to relate to him. Because when you and I have to persevere, we already know somebody who had to persevere with a whole lot more weight than we have. And he's not somebody that can't relate to us. He was very man, very much man. Watch this. Okay, we ended with this, this, to these points here. Watch this. Hebrews 2, 12 rather, 1 through 3. Many are familiar with this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Notice he said, strip it off, lay it aside, the old King James says. And let us do what? Run with endurance. The traditional King James says patience. And in the margin in my study Bible, the footnote for the word patience is perseverance. So he says, let us run with what? Perseverance. The race that God has set before us. So you have a race set before you. And in racing, especially foot racing, really all that matters is what's in front of you. A good coach will tell you, don't be turning around. It costs you time. That, that extra motion is costing. It's fractions of a second, but it costs you. It slows you down. He says, keep looking ahead. He says, keep looking ahead. He says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, what did he do? He endured the cross. He persevered. Persevered through the cross, disregarding its shame. Now, the King James in your traditional Bible, it reads that, and it's kind of blind. That is, you don't see it as well. The traditional way I learned that verse is he endured the cross, despising the shame. But the word despising actually means to think little of. Whoa. Now think of the light that puts on it. It says he endured the cross thinking nothing of the shame. In other words, the embarrassment, the mistreatment, how they dissed him, how they didn't recognize him for who he was as creator and Lord. He said he thought little of that. Our problem is we think much of it. We think much of that, and that slows us down. That's our weight. That's part of our weight. We think too highly of when we are not seen right in the eyes of others. We think too highly, and it becomes a weight to us. Oh, this is good for us. See, he endured the cross. See, you cannot persevere unless you despise shame. By despise, I don't mean, I'm mad at shame. See, that's how we know the word despise. We think it means hate. But remember, that's old English word there. He means thought little about. Didn't care. Didn't give a rip about. How about this in 2019 vernacular? Whatever, dog. Whatever, man. Whatever. Whatever. This was, whatever. I'm not even looking at that. I'm persevering. I got a goal I'm reaching. I can't reach that thinking all about that, right? So despising the shame. And now, because he was able to persevere and think little of the shame, that's why he's seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. And think of all of the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then, if you think about that, you won't be weary and give up. Last scripture. Hebrews 5, 5, 7 through 9. Well, in there, musicians can come. This is that is why Christ did not honor himself by assuming he could become high priest. Hmm. Did not, he didn't assume he could become that. No, he was chosen by God who said to him, You are my son today. I have become your father. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. I believe especially when he was offering those prayers and cries to the one who could save him from death was in the garden. 
Lord, is there any other way to save me from doing this this way? Let your will be done. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Notice verse 9. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest, and he became the source of eternal salvation for all who would obey him. You see, another place, it says, even though he were a son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. Now, what did he suffer? His suffering were not things that we're redeemed from that hell would try to bring us in life and poverty, sickness, and death. It's not those things. What he suffered was opposition and hostility to his purpose. That's actual suffering. That was his suffering that he endured and cried out. God helped him, praise God, and strengthened him. Finished. Father, thank you for your word today. So we bow our heads.